let's get going. Barely Legal 97, again, the only one that ECW produced, took place April 13th, 1997. The attendance was 1,250, which is pretty much what the ECW arena would hold. So here we go. The very first scene you get at Barely Legal is Joey Styles. And if you know the history of ECW, you know what the ECW arena has looked like, and you know where it ends up. This point right here, this opening scene is the nicest the ECW arena will has been and will ever look like while ECW is a functioning company. The ring looks pristine. The lights are very bright. The ring mat looks very nice. Joey welcomes us to the show. He gets interrupted by the Dudley boys, who are the current ECW World Tag Team Champions, sporting their WWF Intercontinental ECW Tag Team Championships, which are interesting because... <laughs> They look just like them. So we have a title match. This is what we're kicking off with. The Eliminators, John Cronus and Perry Saturn against the Dudley Boys, Bubba Ray and Devon, who are accompanied with Joel Gertner and signed Guy Dudley. The The match is pretty quick. Um, it's a lot of high fun. It felt like a uh, showcase for the Eliminators, and I'm pretty sure you know about this, Lou, but for those folks that may have just watched it once or twice, the reason this from what I understand, became a Eliminator Showcase with all their top rope maneuvers and high flying and high spots. It's because Bubba breaks his ankle during this match. Were you aware of that? I was totally aware of that. So basically, um, the idea was for the Dudleys just to put the Eliminators over in six minutes. Um, you know, they definitely made the Eliminators look good because this match is completely atypical of what a traditional Dudley's bo Dudley Boys match would be. So, you know, the fact that Bubba even showed up to do the job, you know, mm. I mean, I think speaks a lot about his dedication to his craft, to the company, and uh, I give him a lot of credit for that. So, like Louis said, it's about a six-minute match. The Eliminators win with Total Elimination, which is a leg whip and leg sweep counter at the same time. They win the ECW Tag Team WWF Intercontinental titles. That's a joke, folks, because they literally look like... But they do look like the IC belt. <laughs> they do look like the classic Intercontinental title from the 90s. I would give this match a 3 out of 5. I thought it was very good, especially considering, you know, Bubba's injured in this match. I, I really enjoyed it. If you recall, you know, there was three guys that got the total elimination. First oh, yes. guy was Sign Guy Dudley. Yep. Second guy was, I think it was Devon. Yep. The third guy was Joel Gertner. Now, when you used to watch ECW on TNN, you remember Joel Gertner would always wear the neck brace? Is this where it came from? This is where it came from. So God, this so gimmick he... has been going on for, <laughs> for from from barely legal up until ECW close. <laughs> and he was in TNA, I believe, in the early days, even if just a one-off appearance, and he wore the... Uh... He wore the neck brace, so Joel Gertner lived this gimmick for the rest of his career. K Fabe is still alive. And after Joel Gertner got his gimmick going for the next uh, three to four years, thanks to the Eliminators, we have Chris <laughs> Candido come out and cut a promo, which I wasn't aware of, about how he was injured and he was a part of the very first ECW, then called Eastern Championship Wrestling uh, event, and he wasn't going to be on the show, but he would make his presence felt somehow, which. He does later in the uh, in the broadcast. Rob Van Dam comes out. Uh, Lance Storm with a massive rat tail. I mean, rat tail to end all rat tails. You cannot this. get a better Canadian rat tail than Lance Storm in 1997. No, you couldn't. And I thought this was a very this was a very good match. You have Van Dam and Lance Storm, not newcomers to the ECW scene, but newcomers in terms of to the to the big stage. This is their first the paper. Dance, yes. Yes. They're not really as well known uh, to a broad audience as some of the other guys in ECW. And this is them at their peak. They're they're athletic. They're they're Van Dam's loving the ECW style in this high flying action. He takes a chair shot from Lance Storm and boy, they are brutal and brutal in a way that they are bad, bad. and soft. Very so soft. Bad. And the crowd reacted to that. <laughs> yeah, the crowd did not like that. Um, interesting note during this, and I, made, I put it in my notes, Lou, is 
that the five star frog splice is just a regular move in this. It's more of a transition move. It's not his finishing maneuver. And as we go along this journey, the frog splash, the five star frog splash always looks, no pun intended, damn good, mm -hmm. but it's not his finishing maneuver. Lance Storm does the weak chair shots. It gets countered <laughs> into a Van Daminator. One, two, three for Rob Van Dam. But to me, more importantly, is the post-match interview or promo, excuse me, because he's not being interviewed by anybody, by Rob Van Dam, because this is when he was doing the cross promotion between ECW and WWF on Monday Night Raw. Mm -hmm. And he's cutting a promo as the fans are chanting, you sold out. And he turns around and he says, I sold out to myself by lacing up my boots tonight as a replacement. Rob Van Dam is no second rate anything. I sold out to myself by performing tonight. RVD has never been known for his promos, and especially in his early days. But this was a great promo and it yes. lays the groundwork for the next year of Mr. Monday Night. Six uh. man tag match. I think I can get most of these names right. So we got Grand Hamada, yep. the great Sasuke, and yep. then I don't know that except they call him Power Ranger because he looks like the Green Ranger. Yakashiji. God bless you. He, he versus <laughs> Yakashiji, his gimmick in Michinoku Pro Wrestling, bless me, was uh he was supposed to be Santa's favorite Christmas elf. Really? Okay, was. so it, it looks like his outfit looks like and they called him when he got in the ring they started chanting Power Ranger. We got that versus the International BWO quote unquote which is Taka Michinoku, Terry right. Boy who's named after Terry Funk mm -hmm. and uh, if you listen to Conrad Thompson he does love some tick, dick to go. Yeah. Tick to go but dick <laughs> to go is the third member of the International BWO and this shows that what was going on in Japan, even though ECW is being revolutionary with obviously like the blood and guts, which is most known for, it's been well documented. And if you're listening to this or watching this, you know about Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko and Tuco Scorpio and other guys like that in like 95, 96, kind of having the other element. Chris Jericho is another one. Conan, Rey Mysterio, yeah. Yeah. This, what these guys were doing in Japan was even different than what was going on in ECW on a day-to-day -day basis. So, Six Man Tech, talk about a high spot fest. This was all over the place in the best way possible. It was yes. really hard at some points to kind of keep up with what was going on. So, I I liked it. It, it, was, it was a good match. Uh, the international BWO was defeated in this. Um, did anything to you stand out to you? Because this got very good reviews on Cage Match. Uh, the Observer gave it four and a half stars. And by those standards, it's actually the match of the night, according to the uh, the Observer. I enjoyed it. I don't think it's the match of the night. Um, I, I would give it maybe three and a half out of five. I, I thought it was enjoyable. It's my second favorite match of the event. Okay. Um, I, I, loved I think it. I have, I'm going to take a guess of what your favorite matches when we get to it but i think it's much later in the show i like this match i think it was a very good showcase of the sampler of ecw the ecw television title is on the line good storyline with shane douglas francine and the pitbulls is a good storyline that franny was the manager of the pitbulls she turned on them but the storyline where shane douglas had injured the neck of pitbull one was great storytelling. Franny turning on the pit bulls was great storytelling. Shane Douglas getting monster heat in the ECW arena was great. And as Bruce Pritchard would say, and then the bell rang. And it just didn't, it, it just didn't feel like a good match from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Douglas is more of a technician. Pitbull is more of a brawler. Yeah. Not that that's saying anything. And again, like Lou said, we don't mean any disrespect to any wrestler on this court or in general because they're way better athletes than us. But to me, Pitbull is the one of the last remaining older ECW wrestlers. Yeah, this is true. Where it's more about brawling and appearance. He looks like he'd be a WWF guy, but it just didn't go well. You could see Pitbull getting winded. Uh, there was a spot where Shane Douglas tries to crotch uh, Pitbull onto a guardrail in the ring, and that gets botched. 
Uh, it's just he's no selling everything brass knuckles a chair shot a piece of the table getting hit it just didn't go well it didn't feel good but this again the storyline was good douglas eventually wins with the belly to belly but the gimmick of this match was there was a certain individual with a mask on that was haunting shane douglas and said he was going to make his life a living hell in 1997 the stipulation was if shane douglas won this match the masked man with his gyrating hips, big muscles, would unmask. And we all knew it was Ravishing Rick Rude. We did? Oh, and no. <laughs> Sorry. Did they, pull, did they swerve us after the match? An individual comes out, and just the facial expressions looks like Rick Rude. You He's think? Got the, but I don't think I don't think Rick got on the juice that quickly. <laughs> no. And then he's got the robe on, and the security guards or riot guards that came, Shane, came down to the ring with Shane Douglas come into the ring with the masked man, takes the helmet off, and Rick Rude is the uh, SWAT gear trooper, so mm -hmm. to speak. And in the mask is Bulldozer Brian Lee, who's also known to wrestling fans as the second Undertaker when they had the Undertaker versus Undertaker match. Yes, Undertaker. Which was great on paper, and then the bell rang. So you had a <laughs> swerve, but here's the thing, Lou, and I've discussed this. All of this Rick Root stuff had zero idea about because it was all off of the DVD from Pioneer. So I had zero idea that any of this happened. To me, this was one of the best storylines of the pay-per-view, but unfortunately, I have to say this is the worst match of the night. It's unfortunate for me to say that I agree with you because I, I love the... I love Shane Douglas as a wrestler. Um, I'm a fan of his podcast. I'm a fan of his wrestling. I really wanted better from this. Um, but even Shane on his podcast admitted that that match could have gone a lot better than it did. It's just something happened where... Mm -hmm. and, and I Could have been I, nerves. Could have been nerves. And I think you mentioned that, you know, Pitbull, who was... Not that he was doing squash matches, but like his matches wouldn't last that long. I mean, this mm -hmm. this match took about twenty five minutes. Yeah, which it was, was over twenty, w which was about fifteen minutes longer than it should have been. So we go from, in my opinion, the worst match of the night to my favorite match of the night, which I'm going to say is still not your favorite match of the night. I think your favorite match of the night is the main event. This was my favorite match of the night, uh, dubbed the Grudge Match of the Century. Wrestling Observer, the Observer gave this match uh, three and a quarter stars. I disagree with that. I would give this. Oh, by the way, the Shane Douglas match, I would give one out of five. It, I think it was really bad. Um, yeah. What would you What would you give on that? One out of five. Okay. Pat, we are at Taz with Bill Alfonso, Daddy, against Sabu. The match goes 17 minutes, 49 seconds. Oh, man. This, to me, was probably one of my top 20 matches of all time. I absolutely love this match Taz is a beast if I had to take one match and show somebody that only saw his work in WWE or just even just knows him as announce as an announcer from WWE TNA and AEW now I would pick this match he is vicious his he gets Sabu in a uh, in a predicament where he's kind of like positioned like it's going to be a camel clutch and just starts giving him cross faces bust Sabu's nose open the Taz flexes in this match are brutal. There was a few where Sabu legitimately lands on his neck. Sabu does his thing. He jump, he does the triple jump into the crowd. It was exactly what was promoted by ECW, that this was going to be a grudge match, hard hitting. It put Sabu over as a maniac, and he didn't tap out to the Taz mission. And actually, in fact, in the beginning of the match, he gets out of the Taz mission which Joey Styles, again, being great, calls it the judo name, the Katahajime, and says nobody's ever broken out of it. So within the first few minutes, Sabu gets out of it. So Sabu is still a madman. He's still crazy. But Taz looks like an absolute killer in this match. Um, how did you view the outcome of it? We'll talk about the post-match stuff in a moment, but just the match itself, the, it was a clean finish, no shenanigans. Taz wins via submission but not an actual tap out just a pass out with the Taz yeah. mission 
I finally got to see the crazy man Sabu. Um, that man deserves more credit that he's given for mm -hmm. having revolutionized the sports the way that he did. And Taz was a killer. You know, I, I don't care if he believed his own hype. We believe his own hype. I mean, we you know, did. this was this was the guy, the only wrestler I know, when he would come out, like the bell would ring during his match, and the fans would start singing, Taz is gonna kill you. You know what I mean? Like, he was believable. And he certainly was. This yes. match was a five out of five. I agree. Uh, this is my match of the night. Uh, <laughs> I will, overall, I would give it a four and a half out of five. It's to me, it's almost a five five star match. After the match ends, we get a handshake by Sabu and Taz, and Rob Van Dam comes out and uh... attack. He attacks Taz, and then Sabu joins in, and we got a two on one. And Bel Alfonso comes in the ring, Daddy. And he reveals that he's going to align himself with Van Dam and Sabu. They put Taz through a table, and now we got a whole new heel faction. So Sabu turns heel. Van Dam solidifies himself as a heel. And Bill Alfonso is now the voice piece for Sabu, who doesn't talk. And Van Dam, who although cut a great promo in the beginning of the event, even by his own admission, was not a very good talker until... Probably 1998-99, he's been, I, I've heard him say. He wasn't comfortable doing promos. So, again, to the genius of Paul Lee, we got this guy who could talk, and we got a guy that doesn't talk, and another guy that isn't comfortable talking yet. Taz doesn't need to talk anymore, and when he does, he gets his message across. It was a great swerve. I really liked it, but I hate that whistle. That whistle, I hate it. I hate the whistle. You know, I, I, I want to say that I've experienced uh, the Mandela effect where I think I was at an ECW Outslot show where somebody brought a whistle and blew it in Fonzie's face and there was a whistling back and forth thing. I want to <laughs> say that I remember this happening, but I'd be lying to you if I said it did happen. But I think I saw that happen in real life. We're going to wrap up with the real deal. So kind of a double main event. The first match is a number one contendership three-way dance which is an elimination folks we got terry funk beat stevie cool which is stevie richards and the sandman in an elimination three-way dance terry funk brings in the ladder at one point for the uh, i call it the three stooges uh gimmick where he's got it wrapped around his head and he's spinning in circles all you were missing was a woo -woo 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 -woo. <laughs> pretty much uh sandman takes a brutal unprotected ladder shot at one point which is absolutely it's rough. It's they, rough to see. They didn't know uh, about concussions back then. <laughs> and they probably and uh, and if there was one night that ECW was not going to worry about it, it would be tonight. There were balls to the wall. Um, actually, the Observer gave this uh, a four. They gave this match four stars, which is ironic. What did they get? Did they give that more than they did? That's interesting. So the Observer gives this match this the whole thing, not just a three way dance. They're talking about this. And the winner facing Raven, they gave all this pack, this whole package, four stars, but only three and a quarter to Taz and Sabu, which I I don't agree with. I think this was a good match, but nothing great. Uh, we got Tommy Dreamer on commentary saying like three words. Yes, but and, my God, did Buell look gorgeous that night? Oh, Buell, that was my Buell, lady. That was that my was lady. Your okay, see. Now, my girl turns into Beulah number two down the road, but that's in, like, 99. We got a little bit till we get there. There was also another a very scary spot where the ladder is teetering on the top rope, and Big Stevie Cool and Terry Funk are kind of hovering over it. The Sandman jumps and tries to teeter-totter it. It kind of hits them, but it legitimately goes flying into the audience and nobody cares because you're in ECW yeah. and you're not even if cell phones were around back then you would know better you're in ECW in the front low don't be on your phone don't be talking to your buddy pay attention to what's going on and holy crap here comes a ladder at me uh, Stevie Cool Big Stevie Cool is the first eliminated uh, via like a double power bomb roll up by uh, Funk and Salmon at 15 minutes 43 seconds this leaves us down to the Sandman and Terry Funk. Winner faces Raven immediately after this. And like I said, we see the streamers come back out. Because when the six-man uh, Japanese tag team match happened, they took the 
or the flare and put it underneath the ring. So when Terry Funk pulls out the barbed wire, the streamers are stuck to the barbed wire. This is true. So it's rainbow colored barbed wire and it was legit and it's gross because it lands on Sandman at one point. You can see it and it's, it's, it's disturbing. Yeah. But hey, it's ECW. We have Terry Funk win. He defeats the Sandman. He faces Raven, who is sporting a very nice looking ECW World Championship. You, this you doesn't failed, look like it's a knockoff. You failed to mention how Funk won. If I recall correctly, he did a moonsault. Off the ladder. Off the ladder. Onto yep. the Sandman, who was wrapped in a barbed wire and the garbage can. A 53-year-old, middle-aged and crazy coot. Yeah. Like Terry I Funk doing a moonsault. I don't have it in me anymore. I don't have it in me anymore. That I'm a man. Funker. I'm a baby face. <laughs> yeah. So you were right. I apologize. I was getting ahead of myself with Big Dick Dudley because... You just wanted to say Big Dick <laughs> So Raven comes out. Terry Funk at this point is getting beaten pretty bad. He's bloody. This is when Raven takes the mic and taunts Tommy Dreamer, which leads Tommy Dreamer to stand up. And that's when Big Dick Dudley attacks. Uh, he attacks Tommy Dreamer. We think Dreamer is going to get, you know, choke slam through these tables like he did, I want to say, a year or so ago. Possibly the worst choke slam in the history of pro wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> because Dreamer tries to choke slam Big Dick Dudley, who's probably six foot eight, 300 and something pounds. Yep. And he's about to go through three tables, probably about 20 feet up in the air. And he. Dreamer tries to throw him, but he doesn't jump. And then Big Dick just kind of jumps by himself and puts him through the tables. It, The visual of him going through the table is awesome, but the split second beforehand is it's a botch. It, it yes, bo but the fans still reacted crazy to it with one yes. of the loudest CCW pops ever. And Joey sold it with the loudest, oh, my God, since Brian Lee fell through the tables off the scaffold at high incident. Wow, they can go knowing your stuff. I actually saw that on one of the Pioneer DVDs as well. Uh, Raven and Funk is not much of a match. There's a, I don't know if it was supposed to be a 2 and, you know, 2.99 near fall, um, or they actually did botch it, but either way, the Funker wins via a, a, a inside cradle. One, two, three, place goes crazy. Dreamer comes down the ringside. The Funker is bleeding like a stuffed pig. But at 53 years old, middle-aged and crazy, he is the new ECW World Champion. Crowd's going crazy. Fade the black. And then, apparently, according to Tommy Dreamer on the Rise and Fall of ECW DVD, the power blew at the ECW arena about 30 seconds after they went off the air. Mm-hmm. Which why, folks, when we continue this journey, there will never be another pay-per-view at nope. the ECW arena. I would give this 3.5 out of 5. It was a good match, but the storyline was more important than I dare say the match. It was one of my father's most recent funk matches, and we were both in awe of what he was doing. At and that age. And, you know, just to see him doing what he loved doing and, and to do what he did for ECW to help elevate them. God bless Terry Funk and rest in peace. You don't have to win to go over, you know? I agree. And Stevie, first guy out. Sam and second guy out. Terry got them both over, you mm -hmm. know? And it's a shame that no other promotion saw the value in Stevie Richards and Sam and the way Paul E did. Because, I mean, Funk made them look good. To go off of what you said and it kind of put in a bow on this about Terry Funk, you don't have to win to get over. To me, the best example of that ever is Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania 13. Oh, that match just... He lost the match. Yeah, he did. But it doesn't matter that he lost. He got bigger because he lost that match. And ironically, we're talking about Barry Legal... April of 97. I don't know exactly when WrestleMania 13 was, but it's March or April of 97. So it's not a coincidence. It was shortly before that. It was yeah, March it was, of 97. Yeah, we're to, it's we're talking spring of 97. It's not a coincidence that the ECW everybody pretty much knows that ECW's revolution sparked attitude. And attitude was first seen to many people at WrestleMania 13. So 
Coincidence? I don't think so. No. Um, my thoughts on this is, even if you're not a massive ECW fan, if you're just a fan of pro wrestling, not a certain genre of wrestling or a certain company of wrestling, if you just like pro wrestling in general, this is one of the few ECW DV, uh, DVDs. Uh, well, I guess technically it is a DVD. ECW pay-per-views, I would say, try to at least enjoy it. Just kind of wrapping this up, what's your final thoughts of this uh, pay-per-view, their first ever, and I believe they only had about 23, 24 pay-per-views. I've, I've lost count, but I will say this. Barely Legal set the precedent for ECW, their future pay-per-views, and it set the wrestling world ablaze because it showed that there was truly an alternative to mm -hmm. WWF and WCW. Um, and, you know, wrestling's like ice cream. You know, everyone likes something a little different. Yep. This was Basket Robbins 31 Flavors. There was something for everyone. No matter how extreme it was, it was extremely awesome is what it was. It was. I give this a solid thumbs up, this pay-per-view. Uh, without question, I think it's one of the more better pay-per-views that they've done. Taking away the, it's their first one ever, and it was revolutionary just as a standalone event, I still give it thumbs up. Um, next on the docket is ECW's second pay-per-view, August of 97, which is Hardcore Heaven. But when we start the show, there's going to be some things we have to go over. Raven, we have to go over. We have to go over Jerry Lawler making it an invasion. Uh, Born to be Wired, the infamous uh, Sabu, Terry Funk, barbed wire match for the world title. There's a lot of things that happen in between the first and second pay-per-view. And dare I say, there was uh, an event called Wrestlepalooza 97 not available on the WWE Network. Why? But why? Because if you're like me and have the DVD of it, you can go back and watch it. So Physical we're going media. to very quickly go over that because there was such, it's changed, the landscape of ECW changes between the first and second pay-per-view. So we're going to go over that quickly at the yeah. intro of our Hardcore Heaven 97 episode. Um, you know, Lou, I want to thank you for coming on board today. It's going to be a fun journey. Yes, thank you for having uh, me. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, the link to the theme song will be available in our comments section. So if you like this theme song, you can give a listen to it on Lou's, uh, on his YouTube page. Anything you want to plug before we take off? Yeah, so me and Alex Repetti, my vocalist from Severed Angel, we recorded that for you, Lou. We were happy to do it. Um, so our official band is Severed Angel. Mm -hmm. You can stream us everywhere. You can buy physical copies at severedangel.com. Uh, the project name that Alex and I are working with that we recorded this song uh, we the cover of this is uh, this is extreme and another song that we sent to you lou that you ended yep. up loving thank you for that yep. uh we are going to release those under the banner mrgsc or mr gsc or mavs repetti our last mm -hmm. names gold standard of excellence because that's what we do so uh we'll let you know when those uh versions come out so you can listen to them and uh if you like what you hear, if you want to solicit myself and Alex to record music for you, you let us know. Uh, I'll give Lou my info, and he can give it to you all. And, yep. you know, if you want to check out podcasts that I'm on, there's Music is Life podcast, which is my podcast, but we're going through a rebrand of that. But the channel's still, still up, and the episodes are staying. Uh, my main podcast is over at Rat Style Review, which, again, is available on YouTube and all streaming platforms. And, Lou, thank you for... Uh, giving me the opportunity to plug my stuff. I appreciate it. You're a good man, a good friend. And this was a blast. I love talking ECW with my boys. Anything you want to see on the channel, because we just were about to hit 11. Well, by the time this comes out, we'll be over 11,000 subscribers. Leave us leave us a comment. Wrestling, sports, entertainment, sports entertainment, um, pop culture. Just let us know. That's how we can produce content that you guys want to see and listen to. So, again, appreciate it. Thank you very much. And we'll Thank catch you. you down the road next time. SeverAngel.com. <laughs>